Quest of the Warrior Maiden by Linda C. McCabe. Chapter Two. Bradamont paused at the crest of a hill and scowled at the empty road stretching before her. The rear guard of Charlemagne's retreating army was still not in sight. She shook her head in frustration and took a long drink of water from her flask. How much longer until I catch up with them? Returning her flask to a saddlebag, she turned behind. As she watched the two warriors in the distance, Rodemont made a wild swing of his sword at the other night. She was relieved to see him miss, but then guilt tore through her. What have I done? How could I relinquish a duel for a Saracen to finish? I took over that fight when Rodemont was about to deliver a death blow to my kinsman Orlando. What if that Saracen knight dies in my stead? Rodemont will likely boast that Orlando and I were cowardly and abandoned our fights with him. Rodemont's face burned as she imagined the humiliation she would face. All because she had grown weary of fighting and wanted to rejoin Charlemagne's army. Her reputation and that of her famed cousin depended on an unknown knight being victorious over a ruthless enemy. May Rodamont rot in hell. Rodamont tugged the reins on her horse, prodding him to return to the battlefield the horse was pulling hard on clumps of grass and resisted. I know you were a hungry Erebus. So am I. When our duty is finished, we shall both find something to eat. The promise was as much to herself as to her pure black companion. She was tired, sore, and hungry, and wanted nothing more than to eat and sleep. Returning to fight Rodemont was an obligation. Needing to gird herself to face her enemy, she actively purged any thoughts of defeat. However, she was distracted by questions about the courteous Saracen knight and various pretenses she might have for speaking with him. The setting sun gave the plain an orange-red hue over patches of black bloodstains. Despite herself, even from a distance, she enjoyed watching the spectacle of two well-trained combatants exchanging blows. Rodemont was becoming erratic while the younger knight appeared to be gaining the upper hand. As Rodemont drew near, she was surprised to realize her champion was using the flat side of his blade rather than its edge. This is not a tournament. This is war. Rodamont will kill you if given the chance. Rodamont held her tongue lest she interrupt the young knight's concentration and provide Rodamont an advantage. She did not want to witness the death of a chivalrous knight at her enemy's hands. A sense of relief came over her as the younger knight pummeled Rodemont. He slung his shield over his own back and delivered a two-handed strike to Rodemont's helmet. Rodemont smiled as the arrogant commander slumped forward onto his horse's neck. His sword fell to the ground with a resounding clatter. Lowering his blade, the victor watched Rodemont dangle in the saddle. Courtesy and mercy being extended to such an unworthy recipient amazed her. Pardon me, sir, Rodemont called out. He turned and bore a look of surprise on his face. I appreciate your championing my cause, she said. However, I was wrong accepting your generous offer. The duel was not yours to finish, and you should not fight with a fellow soldier. Should Rodemont recover and wish to continue, please allow me the honor of ending this fight. 
smiling at her. He nodded his assent. Rodemont began stirring. His eyes appeared unfocused as he rose in his saddle. But when he saw his empty right hand, he emitted a curse. Your courtesy is the victor today, he said, but you failed. You should have killed me when you had the chance. I admit defeat and will leave, but mark my words. I will get my revenge for your insolence. Rodemont retrieved his sword from the dusty plain, his face convulsed with anger before he rode toward the Saracen encampment. Rodemont faced the young knight, feeling unsure how to proceed. As you said, the battle is over for the day, so she replaced her sword in its scabbard. It is, he agreed, sheathing his sword. There was silence as they exchanged nervous smiles. The conical helmet covered his brow ridge and the nose piece obscured the center of his face. From what Bradamont could see, he appeared handsome, but she wanted to see his full face. I admire your prowess, she said. Your skills are impressive as well. Thank you. She felt the heat of a blush forming on her cheeks. Why did you hold back against Rodemont? He would have killed you, then gloated about it. I saw no honor in killing him. Yes, well, you should be wary. He might murder you during the chaos of a battle to cover up the crime of killing a fellow soldier. Tell me what you know of him. He is ruthless and cruel. I battled him once before, when Rodemont could not defeat me. He attacked my horse. I was trapped under its body. Thankfully, there was a depression in the ground beneath me, or I would have been crushed to death. I was not found until the next morning. Attacking horses? He said, gritting his teeth. Rodemont is worse than I thought. There is no one I hate more. I would show no mercy if anyone dared harm Frontino, patted the neck of his dun-colored stallion. Why were you still on the battlefield? to even come upon my duel, asked Bradamont. I was searching for someone. I fear he may have died or been injured. I checked the areas, areas where we fought today, but did not find him. Now I wonder if he is waiting for me back at the camp. Let us hope that is the case. Allow me to escort you. There are bandits who lie in wait for lone riders. I would be grateful for your company. Rejoining Charlemagne's army had become secondary to Bradamont's desire to learn more about this knight. Tell me what he looks like, and I will help you search for him on our way. Atala is old with white hair and a long beard, he said, as they traveled slowly back to the ridge. You must think me foolish for searching amongst the dead. On the contrary, I prayed during that long, cold night when I laid on a battlefield that one of my brothers or a kinsman would come looking for me. He fixed his eyes upon her. Thank you. My friends were not as understanding as you. They thought I was mad for passing up a chance to sack Toulouse. Bradamont broke his gaze. She had never felt nervous around a man before. Being with this young knight was intoxicating. Casting her eyes over the ground, she avoided focusing on the shield designs. She did not want to put a name on any of the dead. In the distance, near the Saracen encampment, a small contingent of surgeons and plunderers emerged, beginning their own search among the fallen. Tell me about Atala. He is all the family I have and has been my guardian since I was born. What happened to your parents? 
My father was murdered. My mother died in childbirth. Radhaman's heart ached at the thought. Her family provided her with a sense of strength. She could not imagine being an orphan. I am sorry for the loss of your family, she said, feeling woefully inadequate. He nodded and then turned away from her, though not before no she noticed a glistening in his eyes. Atala, he called out after clearing his throat. She added her voice to his. Together, they repeatedly called out Atala's name. Night would soon be upon them, and Bradamont was no closer in finding Charlemagne's army. Logic told her she should be galloping away, away while there was still some light left. But her heart overruled. How could she leave the side of the only man who had ever stirred passion in her without knowing his name? How would she ever find him again? Rodamont brought her horse to a halt. She spied a white-haired man lying face down. Could that be him? The young knight dismounted and walked over to the man. Kneeling, he carefully turned the body over and gave a sigh of relief. Praise Allah! As the knight moved, Bradamont saw the dead man's face clearly. The first thing she noticed was the man's lack of a beard. And she fixated on his full white mustache and blue eyes. Eyes she recognized. Eyes that laughed at her the first time she ever wielded a practice sword. It was his scorn that lit her inner fire at the tender age of three. He was the one who christened her the maid. He had meant it as an insult, but it quickly became her nickname. She proved to him time and again that women warriors were no laughing matter. And now he was dead. Her throat tightened as she bowed her head and made the sign of the cross. Do you know him? asked the knight. Yes, that is, or was, Duke Guillaume of Orléans. The young knight folded the man's hands upon his chest and then closed the man's eyes. I am sorry for your loss. Bradamont fought back tears. His sentiment was simple and heartfelt, as was the gesture of respect he made to the dead. Coming from an enemy soldier made it all the more overwhelming to her. She took a few deep breaths, trying to recover her composure. Warriors did not cry on the battlefield, no matter the circumstances. As then she realized they were not far from the crest of the hill where she had first paused before returning to her fight with Rodemont. The idea of parting from him caused her pain. A wild thought crossed her mind. What if I asked him to come away with me? Would he? Was he dear to you? The knight asked as he remounted his horse. His question startled her. No, I, I, what is it that vexes you? You have been kind to me more than I deserve. Your courtesy is greater than anything I have ever seen demonstrated by Christian warriors, even Charlemagne. I am upset because had we met in battle earlier, I might have killed you. I would never have met you or known how honorable you are. That thought gives me pain, as well as the idea of someone as noble as you dying in battle. It would be a tragedy. I must know your name and your family. He gave her a warm smile as their horses began walking again. I share your feelings. In this short time, 
I feel a greater kinship with you than with my comrades. I hope to never cross swords with you. I would hate myself if I were to harm you in any way. You asked of my family. I must start with my noble head ancestor, Hector of Troy. My sense of honor comes from him. I strive to live up to his image as the perfect knight. It is his standard that adorns my shield. Rodamond felt her breath catch in her throat. She had grown up hearing many tales of that legendary hero's prowess and valor. The young knight held up his shield for her inspection. Its leather covering bore a hand-painted design of a silver eagle on a field of blue. Hector of Troy is your ancestor? I thought his only son died in the fall of Troy. The Iliad is wrong. Hector's widow Andromache spirited their son Astyanax out of the city with a trusted friend. The Greeks murdered Andromache and another Trojan child, which led them to think they had ended Hector's bloodline. Astyanax grew up on Sicily and as a young man slew a giant while rescuing the warrior queen of Syracusa. They later married. A warrior queen? What was her name? asked Bradamont, awed that her companion had clearly read an epic poem she had only heard about. I wish I knew. Her name has been lost to history. She was as brave as a Styanax, perhaps braver. Their life together was short. He was betrayed and slain by the Greek villain Aegisthus. The, wari the warrior queen was heavy with child and fled for her life in a small boat, barely escaping the clutches of the Greek army. She landed safely in a cove in Reggio, where she bore Styanax's son, Polidoro. Bradamont was pleased to hear pride in his voice at being descended from a female warrior, but her thoughts quickly shifted to the plight of the nameless queen. She imagined the terror an expectant mother must have felt fleeing for her life in a boat, not knowing where she would land, as well as worrying about when and where she would go into labor. The young knight described succeeding generations of his ancestors, captivating Bradamont by a verbal weaving of his family's tapestry. It was when the names Charles the Hammer, Pepin the Short, and Charles the Great were mentioned that she came out of a reverie. Pardon, she interrupted. Did you say Charles the Great? I did. Floviano of Rome brought forth two famed lines of descended, descendants. One line includes Charlemagne, and I am descended from the other. Bradamont was awestruck. She was distantly related to him because her mother was one of Charlemagne's sisters. This young man was not her enemy. He was a kinsman, a distant kinsman, but he was still a kinsman. It also meant her family was descended from royal Trojan blood. That new knowledge made her swell with pride. He stopped his horse after reaching the top of the ridge. My grandfather, Duke Rampaldo, was a kind, honorable man and a wise ruler of Reggio. He had two sons. My father was named Ruggiero II. The other son was Beltramo, my uncle. My father married Galaziella, a warrior he met in battle. Your mother was a warrior? Yes, an accomplished warrior in the Muslim army. I do not know how my parents met, but it was during a war in Italy. She was baptized a Christian and they married. Bradamont's heart leapt. Might he follow in his mother's footsteps and convert his faith for love? For my love? She almost laughed out loud, realizing 
He most likely did not even know he was talking with a woman. Tendrils of fog crept over the hillside. She knew they would need to find someplace safe to spend the night before darkness descended. But how to bring up such a subject? My uncle was jealous and wanted my mother for himself, the knight said. He betrayed my father and grandfather, which led to their murders. My mother escaped Regia while it was being pillaged. She died giving birth to me. I am Ruggiero the Third, named after my father. Ruggiero of Reggio, she said, turning the sound of his name over in her mind. Tell me where you were raised. On the summit of Mount Corena in Tunisia. It was just a tall in me, no one else for miles around. He taught me to hunt, as well as the art of the joust and swordplay. How did you learn to speak Frankish so well? Atala insisted that I become a man of letters, like my father. He taught me several languages, including yours. I am impressed. I have a passing knowledge of Arabic. A few phrases I picked up on the battlefield. The one thing in life that gives me difficulty is the Greek language. That is my vein. Rogero laughed. Greek was difficult to master. Tell me how you came to serve Akramont, she pressed. I remember hearing of your father's admirable service to Charlemagne. Why are you his enemy? Akramont made me a knight. And you were a Saracen? I am a Muslim, Ruggiero corrected her. That is how my guardian raised me. Please, tell me of your name and family. Rodamont was overcome hearing Ruggiero's tale of his family's history of valor and tragedy. The request for her name was a simple enough return courtesy, except she hoped by revealing her identity she might stir passion within his heart to match hers. Then perhaps he would run away with her and join Charlemagne's forces. That I will answer happily. I am from the house of Lyon. My father is Duke Aimon of Dordogne. His most famous son is the celebrated Count Renaud of Montauban. And I, she paused as she removed her helmet and pulled at the tether in her hair. And Renaud's sister, Bradama. Ruggiero was stunned. He had assumed the sweet voice of his companion was that of a youthful male whose voice had not yet changed. He stared as her golden tresses cascaded over her shoulders, catching the last gleams of light from the setting sun. He wondered how he had ever been so blind to think he was talking with a male soldier and had never considered he might be in the company of a woman. No, he corrected himself. He was in the company of a beautiful woman. His feelings of being drawn to her were not out of a sense of kinship with an honorable warrior, but out of attraction. As he looked into her eyes, he imagined his father reacting similarly when he met Galaziella, or how Paris felt upon meeting Helen of Sparta. Ruggiero then understood why the Trojan War was fought over the love of a woman. If necessary, he would kill a thousand men for her. Defending her earlier from Rodemont, he originally thought had been about idealism. Now he realized its true significance. Fate had meant for him to come upon that duel and to protect her from harm. Bradamont had suddenly become the most important thing in his life. Please, Ruggiero, remove your helmet, she said. He quickly complied. Bradamont gave him a smile, showing that she shared his feelings. The Greek god Eros, could not have invoked a more powerful response in two people. Ruggiero was afraid of saying anything, lest he break the magic of the moment. He was barely aware that the hills were turning a dark purple 
and the air filling with thick fog. A crash behind him made Ruggiero jump. A voice called out, there is one now, and it is the maid. Get her. A horse galloped up the hill. Ruggiero turned as a mounted soldier's sword hit Bradamont squarely in the back of her unprotected head. If you enjoyed this presentation, I invite you to discover my novels, Quest of the Warrior Maiden and Fate of the Saracen Knight. They are available in both ebook and trade paperback. Signed copies are available from the wonderful independent bookstore Kazoo Books in Kalamazoo, Michigan. You can find them online at kazoobooks.com. You can also visit my website at www.lindacmckay.com or at questofthewarrymaiden.com and join my mailing list. The music is Ruggiero by Gaspar Sanz and played by Giacomo Fiore.